Come here, brother. We went to a restaurant out in, uh, where is that, in Woodbridge. And, and what I was thinking about was um, what has just made me love Carrie so much is his love for Jesus. Um, Carrie's the kind of guy that when you get around him, um, you're looking at scripture together. You're spending quality time in prayer together. And Carrie's the kind of brother that when you're around him, you want to be more and more like the one that he loves so dearly. And so I'm, I'm confident that that's going to come out in his preaching today. Carrie is um, getting ready to go down to Norfolk to plant Pillar Norfolk. So um, we're going to be supporting Carrie um, in that endeavor. Um, today we're supporting him through prayer, through listening to this preaching, and to just uh, let you get to know Carrie a little bit more. So, brother, thank you. Thank you. It's good to have you. <clears throat> Mike's trying to make me cry, you know. Uh, <laughs> in my head, I was going to come, like, you know, all confident and stuff, and then he's like, make me want to tear up. So uh, I am very, very grateful to be here with y'all this morning. As he said, my name is Carrie. If you could please take out your Bible or smartphone and turn to uh, Psalms 42. We're going to be reading it in ESV. Um, and as you guys do that, I'll tell y'all a little bit more about myself. Um, so my wife and I have been married uh, for two and a half years, and we have two children under two. <laughs> yeah, you, you know kind of what the household is like right now. Um, meanwhile, I'm also serving at Pillar Church of Dumfries. I'm the current church planning resident there. And um, I get to go through the same uh, pipeline that Mike and Ted just recently went through, which is a deep honor. Um, and it's an honor especially because of what I want to see done in Norfolk. I stand here, I look at everyone in this room, and I see that the Lord has brought something to life out of nowhere in less than a year. And we want to see that same thing done next year uh, by uh, August 2023 in Norfolk. So we ask for your prayers with that, and I mean, we even ask some of y'all, you can come too, you know what I mean? We'll have a good time. Um, so in the meantime, I've been a traveling preacher, uh, going from church to church to church, sharing the good news about Christ, uh, which is helping me grow as an expositor of God's word, but it's also beautiful because I get to see another church plant, another church plant. You know, you go from Acts, and you see it in Acts 2, and then you see church plants from there, and then you see them still happening today. And so I just want to continue on uh, with that work. Uh, so with that said, I want to just uh, say something that we all already know in this room. Life is full of roller coasters. Um, that was my case just about a year and a half ago. Uh, we were living in D.C. in the basement uh, of a row home. And then meanwhile, uh, we were excited because we were coming up here to Dumfries. So just to give you a little context of D.C., everything is really tight, uh, so much so that you got to park your car on the street and all this jazz. Well, we were so excited at knowing that both of our cars would be able to be parked in a place. You don't have to think about zone parking, uh, which costs a couple hundred dollars. Um, and then we could park our car at the grocery store without paying for it. Uh, all that to say... You can just, you hear it in my voice. We were so, so, so excited. And um, we had just had our son. Um, my family was about to come up and spend time with us. This was going to be their second time seeing him. Uh, he was seven months old at a time. Uh, they were about to fly up to us. So as, like, man, we're just on a high. But in the meantime, my granduncle in Florida was declining in health. Uh, he had been declining for a couple months, and he actually passed. Uh, two days before my family's supposed to come up. So now I'm thinking, like, what are we going to do? Should they come up? Should they not? Well, my mother and my sister came, but my father stayed behind. That was my father's uncle. So he stayed behind to help with the preparations of the funeral. And um, myself, I'm, I'm packing boxes. I'm packing boxes left and right. And I'm left in a, in a place to process um, and feeling torn, I'm thinking to myself, wait, should I go to this funeral? Or should I stay with my mother, or excuse me, my wife and my, uh, and my young son um, and, and focus on this move? And so 
I did the move, and I barely had time to process the emotions. Honestly, I still haven't had the time to fully process the emotions. I just kept going. And um, Benjamin Franklin, he has a saying that falls um, pretty good with where I'm going. Um, you know that saying where he says, um, in life, there's two things that are certain, death and taxes? Well, I want to add one more to that, which is the fact that there's going to be a lot of problems in, in life, especially for us Christians. And um, here's the thing about the problems, right? You don't get a text or an email notifying you, hey, I'm going to be coming soon. Um, they just knock at the door. Next you know, they want to be let in. And on top of that, they want to be catered to and, like, really good at that. <laughs> and some of y'all are nodding your head, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And um, here's the thing. Jesus said we would have these problems. He said to his children, um, he said, in this world there will be trouble. But he then says, take heart because I have overcome the world. So the thing is, problems are coming, period. doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter where you're from. They're coming. And so Psalm 42, it's going to lay out a blueprint for us on how to handle the problems. It's going to give us a blueprint, a roadmap. So I'm going to pray here, and then we're going to feast on God's word. Father, thank you for this time to share your word. Thank you for um, Mike's kind words. God, I pray as the deer pants for the water, um, our souls long for you. I pray that you um, help us to understand how much our souls pant. I pray that you help us understand um, where to get the quenching for the panting. Um, I pray that you help us understand that we're, we're, we're like the deer. We're very simple, um, and we have a complex creator. Uh, I pray these things, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here it is. Um, if you have your Bible, it's uh, Psalms 42. We're doing English Standard Version. Uh, here we go. It says, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? My tears have been food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you in turmoil with me? Excuse me, within me. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls out to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Key verse right here. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So, you know, I, I said that quote about Benjamin Franklin. Um, well, in between taxes and death are problems. And the psalmist has a couple of them going on, just to list a few of them out. Uh, it says his tears, he has tears for food. Um, he's being taunted throughout the day. 
And then he's downcast, which is, in other words, him saying he's discouraged. He says that three times. He feels forgotten. He's dealing with grief. He's oppressed by his enemies. I think we can all relate to that in some way, shape, or form in this room. We've all been through something similar like that at some point. But somehow, the psalmist is able to break out of it, even though it doesn't necessarily seem like that at times as you read the psalm. But there is a blueprint. And so I want to just lay it out for us, and then I'll explain it further. So here's what happens. You're going about your normal business. Then out of nowhere, a problem shows up, and it affects you spiritually. And then we can tend to seek for coping mechanisms to deal with that pain. One of the ways we could do that is by going to the good old days, right? Then step three, this one isn't as common. We need to take time for self-reflection. And then step four, what happens is there's God-given discovery. So we're going to see that throughout, um, throughout our time here as, as we speak. So um, let's go and unpack the first point, the problems. Um, so you see his, him talking about his problems in verse 1 through 4, um, verse 6 to 7, and then verse 9 to 10. Now, there's a buffet of problems that we could talk about. Um, we could talk about the gas prices that skyrocket out of nowhere. We could talk about the, uh, the student loan crisis that's going on, and is there going to be relief? Is there not going to be relief? Um, we have a buffet of problems to choose from, um, and some of the problems, they're physical problems, too. Now, in the case of our psalmist, he has two specific problems going on. In verses 1 through 4, he starts talking about feeling this spiritual drought. See, in verse 2, it says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Sounds like spiritual drought. And then in verse 3, it says, um, His tears have been food for him all day long, as he's being taunted by enemies. That causes spiritual drought. And I think we can understand where he's coming from. You know how it is. You go about your normal business in the day. The next thing you know, you get home, and you walk into a house full of problems to deal with. And you're thinking, wait, what's going on? You know, I was, I was in this place. All of a sudden, I'm in this new place. And then the problems, they come, and they bring you to a screeching halt. You have to focus on the problem, and now you're not really focusing on your spiritual life. Well, um, then you go into the later part of the psalm in verses 6 to 7 and then 9 and 10. He gets vulnerable about feeling distant from God. In verse 6, he introduces that he feels distant from God in a poetic way. He says, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazar. So John MacArthur explains that verse like this. The Jordan... And Mount Hermon notations refer to a location in northern Israel, an area of headwaters that flow southward. These locations signal that a sharp contrast in the word pictures describing the psalmist's change in condition is imminent. He is about to move from feeling drought from God to drowning. And so then by verse 7, the psalmist uses what we consider poetic talk as code to say, God, I'm blaming you. You're responsible for these problems that I have. That's why I'm facing what I'm facing now, and that's why it's affecting me spiritually. So I, I know I'm not alone when I say we've probably blamed God at some point for some issue going on in our lives. And then on top of that, we want him to explain why he put us there, And then on top of that, he needs to fix it ASAP. Um, Maybe it doesn't feel right to bring up the problem to God. Maybe it feels better just to just try to handle the problem on your own. But here's the thing. We need to just step back like I just did. Hopefully nothing's in your way. You just got to step back. There is room for what Scripture calls lamenting. So lamenting... It's a way to to bring up the deep grief, regret, or sorrow going on in our hearts. And it's basically us saying, it's not okay, and I'm okay with saying that it's not okay. 
And that's what the psalmist does, which tells us we can do the same. We can, we can lament before God. We can tell him that we're having trouble. We can tell him that we're feeling grief. We can tell him that we're feeling sad. He wants to hear just like a father wants to hear from their child. Now, here's the thing, too. When, when our thoughts feel most complex and most, uh, our emotions feel most disoriented, that is actually the time to talk to God. That's the time to lament. I know that sounds weird, that sounds crazy, but that's the time. That's the time that he wants to hear from us. And here's the thing, you don't have to have it all sorted out. You can say it to God just like that. You can say, you know what, God? Something's off, and I don't know what's up. I just wanted to talk to you about it. You know, that's, that's, what, a, that's what a child does in a healthy relationship with a parent. You feel comfortable, you feel safe to do so, and we could do the same with God. So I know there's different kinds of people in the room. You, you might need to journal. Some people you might need to get alone in that closet to pray. Maybe you need to talk to a fellow believer. Maybe, maybe you know, I like seeing Ted. Ted just, you know, he just seems kind and he just seems so wise. It's like, man, Ted, I just want to grab a cup of coffee with you and I just want to tell you why I'm hurting. Not that you have the answers, Ted, but I just want to tell somebody I'm hurting. God provided all these options for us. And so the thing for us to do is get that lament off of our chest. And the first step to doing it is going back to Psalm 42, following that blueprint. Now, in our society today, I know that seems pretty weird. Um, sometimes I'm not, I get a little agitated, to be honest. You, you ever um, spend time with just general people and uh, they bring up a problem, but then they wrap it up with a bow? Yeah. My car just broke down, but I'm, I'm okay, you know? Or uh, I remember I was talking to someone, and they were like, yeah. Literally, uh, they, they had, like, a big issue at home that just completely devastated their life. But then they joked it off. Meanwhile, I'm trying to, like, actually, like, get in the moment with them and try to, like, comfort them and just care, but they're joking it off. And it's like, wait, I can't take them any further than they want to go. That, I don't know why, but that's just you know, something that we do in our society. We, we joke things off, we, but we don't really take time to sit in the moment and say, hey, it's not okay. So problems are real. Pain is real. Um, and the thing is, um, we can tend to seek quick fixes to help us out of the problems. And one easy reach option is the good old days. Thinking about the good old days in the midst of your present problem. Um, that leads to our second point, if you're taking notes, um, the good old days. And this is where um, we were in a place where in the midst of our problem, we're looking to um, the days when, man, things were hype with God or when we were on a spiritual high with them. Um, I have a friend of mine that uh, is a pastor of a church that's 97 years old. And he was just added on seven years ago. Uh, when he first got introduced to the church, um, you know, they did the thing where they show you different ministries and how the ministries are doing. Well, one of them was VBS. They had almost 40 volunteers for five kids. Three of the five belonged to the pastor. <laughs> Despite that, though, the volunteers are going about and telling them how, man, this ministry was thriving a couple decades ago. Man, we just want to get back to the heyday, so we're just going to hold out until, until we get back there. Now, you can imagine for my friend, he's, he's having quite a hard time trying to say, hey guys, something might need to change. So maybe living in the past could be detrimental to staying in the present. That's the same kind of problem going on for the psalmist between verses 3 and 4. See, verse, it says, My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. I like how it says verse 4 in NLT. It says, my heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds of worshipers leading a great procession to the house of God. 
singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. See, the psalmist, he's in deep distress. And he said his tears are his food as his enemies are taunting him all day long. They're basically saying to him, where is your God? Signifying God is too weak. God is too distant to help. And so what does the psalmist do? The psalmist starts thinking about the good old days in the midst of the heat of the problem. When he was among his church folk and they were having a good old time praising God together. You see, it's a nice memory, but it's not enough. It's not enough to help him in the midst of being taunted so consistently. The psalmist is still discouraged. The memory didn't help him. If anything, he stayed in the same place or got worse. How do I know? You go to verse 5. It says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil with me? Excuse me, within me. So he needs something better. He needs something more satisfying to quench his soul's thirst for relief. So there's a danger in looking to the good old days as healing balm for our current problems, especially spiritual ones. And I'll, I'll just take a second. I'll call myself out. Uh, I told you guys we have two kids. Uh, we went from two incomes with uh, one child to two ch- children with one income. You know, something don't add up, right? Um, and I'm not going to lie to you. You know, we've had times where we're like, man, you remember when we would just get Uber Eats when we were just too tired and stuff like that? Well, those days are gone. Um, but the beautiful thing about this new season that we're in is that we get to trust God in a, in a un- more unique and a, in a sweeter way because there's, there's more of us. And it's like, man, God, do you still provide that same kind of provision? He does. He does. And so um, here's the thing, too. Here's the thing about the good old days. You know, if you're in the midst of the heat and you're trying to use the, the, the good old days as your fuel to help you feel better, what's probably going to happen is you'll, you'll go to self-pity and discouragement, which we don't want to do. If anything, um, when, when we go to that place, it's, it's like giving yourself a drip of water on the tongue when you're thirsty. We want to do the opposite. We want to be quenched completely, right? And so we need to get out of the rut. We need to get out of there completely. And um, so what we need to do is exchange the counterfeits, just the memories. We need to exchange them for the real God, the living God. So it's not inherently wrong to remember the good old days. That's not what I'm saying. Um, God gave us the memories for us to treasure. So treasure them. But... Spiritual memories of the good old days from the past aren't enough to satisfy our craving for God in our souls today. Verse 2 says it like this, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So we can take that very literally. The psalmist's soul thirsts for God. He thirsts for the living God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Your soul thirsts for God, the living God. We need a daily dose of God. So what are we going to do with those old memories? How about we use them as fuel to trust God's goodness today? How about we use those memories as receipts to praise God in the midst of whatever problem that we're facing? He's faithful. He's been faithful before. He'll be faithful again. So we just talked about the good old days and how that can be a problem where if, if you let yourself sit in it, it, it'll just lead you away from being quenched from the thirst. Um, we we want to stay in the present. Um, if anything, they're just counterfeits for the real living God. So that leads us into our, our third point, self-reflection. Um, that's how the psalmist gets out, part of how he gets out of the spiritual rut. Right? So let's go to it and see. Um, Now, I know some of y'all are familiar with the term stop, drop, and roll. Raise your hand if you are. Very good, good. That way, if you're in a fire, you know what to do. Um, Well, anyway, the psalmist does the equivalent of that with his heart. Something's off, so he he stop, drop, reflect. That might might stick in your head later this week. We'll see. Um, Something's off. There's a fire going on. It needs to be put out. So in the midst of um, him having his enemies taunt him, have you ever had people taunt you? I'm sure you have, but imagine it happening for the duration of the day. That's a lot 
of tension. That's a lot of problems. Um, so in the midst of all that happening, though, verse 5 says that he does that. He takes time for self-reflection. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? So the man's asking himself a question. See, the psalmist knows, hey, you know what? Man, that check engine light, it's on. Something's off. And he needs to diagnose the problem. He needs to know, hey, what caused the check engine light? And how do I solve the problem with the check engine light? So it makes it clear for us, part of the way that we're going to get out of a spiritual rut is to stop, drop, reflect. Um, and you don't need to literally drop. Maybe you're at work and you don't have time to <laughs> drop on the floor. But the point is, like, take some time for, for reflection. Um, so we can take that time. It's okay to say to ourselves, what's wrong? What's the problem? See, now, there's nothing profound about what I just said, but it's an important step to take that we can easily skip. Um, we can just take a time in our day where we just pause We pause on the busyness of what's going on in the DMV. We pause from the notifications on our phone. You you put it on do not disturb so that you can check check on that check engine light going on in their heart. So I'm going to just keep this uh, illustration with the car going. No matter how new the car is or how much it costs, the check engine light will come on. It's inevitable. So when that happens, what, what we'll probably try to do is uh, seek some um, quick fix relief. Maybe it's watching TV or, or, or going to so- social media or whatever else we do to try to fix that maintenance light going on. But, but here's the thing. How about how much time is left to, to take to self-reflect for the day? It's a good question. Um, how much time do we have to gauge our heart? Similar to Psalm 139, verse 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. So taking some personal time for self-reflection is good. Our soul is just like the psalmist. The soul, at some point, will tell us, hey, 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 I'm thirsty. And, and when that happens, we need to settle down and give our time, self, excuse me, time to reflect on what's going on. So we talked about the problems, how they come, and then how sometimes we can go to a quick fix to, to get ourselves out of the problem, um, where we think about the good old days, um, but then it, it leaves us still thirsty And so we now know in the roadmap we need to take time for self-reflection. And then there's another step to get us out of that spiritual rut. It is um, what I like to call God-given discovery. I could have said self-discovery, but I chose God-given discovery because it's coming from God. Um, My mom loves going to church. Um, She goes to church, her church on a Sunday morning, and then she has a schedule of every church that's open, night or morning. If there's a midday prayer, she'll be there. If there's like a, um, a revival, she'll be there. No matter what, she'll be there. Um, she loves to pray with saints. She loves to hear God's word. And she loves to fellowship with other believers. Um, my sister and I learned that very early on in our lives as she would take us like from place to place to place to place um, to pray and, and to, to hear God's word. Um, I even had a couple times where she missed my birthday. Not that she didn't love me, but if God laid a mission on her heart, she didn't let anything get in her way. She went. Well, uh, by 16, I got sick, and I needed some mid-level heart surgery. Um, So I needed this surgery, And uh, it was going to be done on a Sunday morning. And I remember I felt a little sad because I was like, man, if if this surgery, Sunday morning, my my family, they're going to be at church. No one's going to be with me. 
So I remember um, the, the surgery happens. They put me under. I don't even want to talk about the surgery. It was horrible. Uh, but um, they put me under, and, I, and I, then I wake up a couple hours later, and I look to my left, and my mom's sitting there. And I was shocked, but I had no energy to actually say anything because I was like, Mom, you miss church. You miss church. And uh, anyway, she missed church, and she's, she's right there reading her Bible. So in that moment, I was so deeply reassured, man, my mom really, really loves me. And sometimes we need that kind of reassurance from God, too. He's near. He cares. He cares about his children. He cares so much that he gives us what I called earlier God-given discovery. Um, let's look at how he does it with a psalmist. Um, he helps the psalm, psalmist rediscover God's love. So um, you look at verse 8. I'm going to read actually a little bit of it in NLT. It says, the Lord pours out his unfailing love upon me. And it's talking about the psalmist. So at the start of the day, the Lord pours out unfailing, steadfast, unending love on the psalmist. Each day, the Lord pours out this unfailing love. It's like a waterfall flowing down from a river with no end. There's no failure in this love. It's always there. And there's no imperfection in this love. There's reassurance in the evening, too. The latter portion of verse 8 says, Through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. So each night the Lord gives the psalmist a song of praise leading to prayer. And all this praise-inspiring love is poured out on the imperfect psalmist daily. So it's, in, excuse me, it's perfect love on an imperfect person. That's, a, that's amazing. But I know just, just like myself, um, we all get into situations where sometimes we're a little bit too busy to think about it. Maybe even forget about it a little bit. So we all need to be reminded of God's love. Similar to a, a deer, a deer needs to be reminded it needs water. We need it to be that consistent in our lives. And so as we, we get those reminders, that quenches the thirst. So the reminder of God's love gives the psalmist confidence to answer the questions he had just asked himself. Um, in verse 5, you see the repetition of it again in verse 11. The latter part of verse 5 says, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. So this guy went from one side of the pendulum to the complete other. He went from, hey, I have no confidence, to where he could talk to himself because of God's love. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. So the psalmist realized that even though he was in a spiritual rut, God had been working behind the scenes. And on top of that, God initiated the work. And then on top of that, God had been dropping the breadcrumbs to make it clear who was working behind the scenes. So even though we get in spiritual ruts like the, spirit, uh, like the psalmist, God is working behind the scenes. He's helping us understand that even when we feel spiritual drought, he sends a rainfall. Even when we feel distant, he remind us he's close. There isn't anything God will hold back from us because he's already given us his one and only precious son, Jesus. See, Jesus was born in the flesh, and he lived a perfect life. And then he made himself a sacrifice in place of our sins. God allowed his one and only son to be murdered and placed on a cross. And then God raised him from the dead three days later. So that Sinners like me and you could be called God's children. So we're in a very sweet spot. God created our souls to thirst for him, and he provided what we needed to quench our soul's thirst, and it is Jesus. He is the well that won't run dry. So even when the spiritual ruts come, just like taxes, we know, just like the psalmist, we're not alone. He's doing the same thing with us. He's pouring unfailing love on us each morning, and he's giving us a song to sing at night. I know I'm not alone how you just go about your day. Sometimes you, all of a sudden you just find yourself singing a hymn, or maybe it's a contemporary song from, from the service. 
this is, this is the Lord's doing, clearly from verse 8. So, you know, it reminds me of the last song that we're going to sing. Um, verse 1 of that song says, Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come and thirst no more. So, brothers and sisters, um, the soul gets spiritually parched, and we need God's assurance of his love, and God will not leave us in a position where we won't know that. He can quench the soul's thirst. He does quench the soul's thirst, just like he did with the psalmist. And so we need to talk to our souls. I know that sounds crazy, but we do, just like the psalmist. We need to tell our souls hope in God. He is good. So, um, so what are we going to do to help ourselves out of the spiritual rut? Well, you can go back to verse 1. It says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. That is our diagnostic verse. That is our solution verse. It paints the picture clear. Our souls pant for God, the living God. He can quench our thirst even when we feel spiritual drought or feel distant from him. Fact of the matter is, we're all going to get to that place where we say, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? And we just need to be reminded of how deep, how wide is the love of God. It is so vast. Now, to some in the room, you might hear, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul thirsts for God. And, uh, you just might want to have a different answer. Maybe you feel pretty well off on your own, and maybe you, you feel like you know exactly what you need. I hear you. I understand. Um, maybe you feel like you have a custom problem that is too difficult for God to solve. How could God solve the problem that you have plus quench your thirst? That's a tall glass of milk. So why should we care about Psalm 42? Well, the soul pants, it's, it's the equivalent of having that check engine light on, and no, no matter the car, no matter how new, no matter how much it costs, the check engine light is going to come on, and there, there is no quick fix. There is no counterfeit that will alleviate our pain. We have to go to God. And so I want to encourage you, uh, through the last song again, through the, a couple verses from it, this is what needs to be done. It says, come all you sinners, come find God's mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy, taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. So, Brothers and sisters, spiritual ruts are coming, just like taxes, just like death. They're not invited. They do not send a text message. We know this. They just knock at the door, and they say, come in and cater to me for your day, maybe longer. Jesus said this was going to happen. He told us, hey, in this world, we Christians will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So we could just use Psalms 42 as our blueprint when that problem comes, just go ahead and skip over trying to dwell on the good old memories of how things used to be. Instead, just self-reflect and then take time to just ponder on how good God is and how much he loves, how deep, how wide is the love of Christ. Pray with me. Father, um, give us the power to grasp the great, the great measure to know the vastness of truth in your great love. Help us experience Christ's love and its riches to comprehend as we glorify your name. No one can measure the depth of your treasure, how deep, how wide your love is. I just want to, um, before they sing, I just want to actually, that I, I made a little melody of that, and I don't know if this is recorded on YouTube or not, but you can sing what I just prayed. I made this melody. Um, it's actually from Ephesians. Um, hear it out. Give us the power to grasp the great measure, to know the vastness of truth in your great love. 
Help us experience Christ's love in its riches to know the vastness of truth in your great love. No one can measure the depth of good treasure. How deep, how wide your love is, your love is. How deep, how wide your love is, your love is. Let's just sing that last part, how deep, how wide your love. I used to lead music, so uh, that explains where this just came from. Let's do it, though. Here we go. We're going to sing, how deep, how wide your love is, your love is. How deep, how wide your love is, your love is. How deep, how wide your love is, your love is. Amen. You guys stand.